Good morning again. So last week, we started a series of work uh, entitling King. The whole idea with it was to kind of take a two-week journey with Jesus. Uh, in the weeks leading up to his death and uh, his resurrection, there were some experiences that we don't always hear a lot about. Uh, the one we're going to look at today is his entrance into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. We probably, most of us, if not all of us, have heard of that. But the idea was just to kind of walk through this journey together. And this week, things really heat up a little bit around here because it's the week, right? Uh, and uh, so we want to give you, as a church family, opportunities to kind of walk this journey with Jesus, familiar from previous years, uh, except this year. Uh, we tried something last year, and we're doing it again this year. On Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to transform our campus into our version of what the city of Jerusalem and surrounding area would have been like. And uh, through a series of vignettes or stories, tell the story of Easter. Uh, so it's going to happen in this building and in that building and a little bit outside. And uh, just encourage you to come as a family. And uh, though it's our kids' staff that are putting this on, hosting it, it is for sure not just a kid event. It is a family event. And that's what we heard over and again last year as people went through it. So uh, over the two nights, you can bring your dinner and whatnot, and tables will be set up. You can enjoy that and then take a walk through Easter. Now, uh, there are already 500 plus people, I think, that have signed up to do this over Wednesday and Thursday. So I really encourage you to register as soon as you can online or at our, uh, our app and get your name in there. And then on Friday, we're going to do a Good Friday service here, which uh, focuses on the cross. It's a reflective service. It's a little darker because of what Jesus has gone through. We just want to sit in that and think about that for some time together on Friday. I think I probably say this every year, and I'll say it again this year. If, if you don't come to like a Good Friday event or, or, like we're doing or others, you, you actually lose a little bit of the thrill and the excitement of Easter morning. You, you almost need that black backdrop to see the clarity of the diamond that is his resurrection on top of that. So if there's a way for you to be part of what we're doing here or another church, and just take the time to reflect Good Friday, and then sunrise and a couple of services here. So you can, you can check uh, that event card that we're handing out at the end. It'll give some more details. Okay, so where were we last week? We looked last week at Jesus leaving northern part of Israel, heading down to Jerusalem with his friends and uh, the dialogue and discussion they have about what Jesus is going to do. Uh, this morning, we want to look at the moment where Jesus walks into Jerusalem for one of the last times in the last week of his life. And uh, on the surface, it may not seem all that significant, but entrances really do make a difference. Every hero needs to be worthy of the kind of entrance they have. And we see that happen throughout our heroes in history and politics, if there are any there, and religion, and, uh, you know, even our movies. A hero who enters... And how they entered reflects kind of who they are, right? Let me give you a few examples. Like, for example, George Washington, right? Crossing the Delaware, he comes in as this conquering victorious general. That's what that says. That's a great entrance. Here's another great entrance, right? Does that speak intimidation, right? Like, that's a, that's a powerful guy right there. Speaking of powerful, here's the next one. This is Wonder Woman powerful woman, right? The original Wonder Woman that I grew up when I was a teenager had an odd power over me as a teenage boy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's Ethan Hunt. Some of the most impossible entrances in movie making history, right? Uh, then there's Luke Skywalker for our Star Wars fans. You know, if you're a Jedi Knight and you're the de facto leader of the of the rebel alliance and the savior of the galaxy, you need an entrance that's worthy of that kind of title. And what you need is an X-65 X-wing flyer, right? That's what you need. That's appropriate for that kind of entrance. Apparently, even Harry Potter and a broom are a good way to enter. Uh, here's one of my favorites, 007, James Bond. That's a beautiful car right there. That is an Aston Martin with a few upgrades from the dealer, right there. 
Yep, it is. And here's another one of my favorites, Indiana Jones, right there. Like, his entrance is right, nothing like it. Okay, I need to pause here just a little bit. I've got to give this guy a bit of a break. Unfortunately for him, there has been the occasion where he has been compared to me. And I think that is totally misplaced. Right? So, the poor guy, right? The poor guy getting compared to me. So back to entrances. Okay, so, it can be presidents, it can be popes, it can be kings and queens, right? Entrances really do matter. William Wallace, right there, right? Braveheart. That's it. They may take our lives, but they won't take our... Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, here's Achilles from Troy. Brad Pitt never gives up like an entrance, right? Never. Uh, uh, Aragorn from, from the Lord of the Rings, right? The king of Gondor on his steed, appropriate. Here's, I think, one of my favorite. General Maximus Decimus Meridius, the gladiator, riding in from a victory over in Germanus. And, uh, you know, he's this king on a steed. Entrances really, really do matter. They do. Can you imagine gladiator, this great general, ever riding in on something like this? <laughs> like a 30-year-old rust bucket of a Mazda Miata. What a wreck. Who would drive something like that, right? No, really. That's not how you enter. Not if you're anybody of any significance. True? Right. Entrances really do matter. They say a lot about who we are. And that car says a lot about its owner. <laughs> so, here's the deal. A week before the world is liberated from sin and death, that's a big deal, right? Jesus makes a carefully calculated and divinely orchestrated entrance into Jerusalem. And if you've never thought about it before, I want to think with you about it today. It is deeply symbolic, and it is very, very significant. What he is teaching in doing this, this vivid, dramatic display, is to a relatively small group of people, he is trying to explain to them who he is and what this is all about. Now, did people not know who he was? Well, yeah, they knew that he was Jesus. They knew that he was a prophet. They knew he came from Nazareth. They knew some stuff about him. But did they know who he really was? Was this entrance to kind of correct a view, an inadequate view of who he was? Well, you know, it's actually not uncommon for us a couple of thousand years later to not know exactly who he is. To mistake him for maybe something or somebody that he isn't. But here's one thing that we've not been able to do for 2,000 years and they couldn't do it the day he walked in to Jerusalem. You can't ignore him. You're forced in a way by who he says he is to make some choice or decision about him. He's a polarizing, he's a dividing person and has been for millennia. We are forced to make some assumptions and conclu some conclusions about who he is. So, I want to take you through that experience from Matthew. I want to read through it. It's just 11 verses. And then I want to look at what the text might teach us. There's something really interesting that happens toward the end of this text. So, let's read together. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 1. You can follow along, read it up on here, or just listen if you wish. This is how it starts. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, remember they've come from the north, They've approached, approached Jerusalem. They came from the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them, two of his friends, on ahead. So what he said, go over to the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there and its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. Now, just so you know, guys, this took place to fulfill the prophecy that said from Zechariah, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. 
So the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, or Hosanna, praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Quite a scene, right? Here it is, Jesus entering Jerusalem, people lining the road into Jerusalem from the gate, probably where he comes in, pulling branches off of palm trees and throwing them on the street, some taking their outer garments off and throwing those into the street as Jesus moves through. Everyone is shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, if you go back to verse 10, it's an interesting thing to me. They have a question that's on their minds. The question is this, who is this? Who is this? Well, hold on just a second. Why would you ask that question? Didn't they know who he was? Evidently they did. Like if you shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that's not just anybody. That's not somebody you don't know. You don't just throw that out. No, they had some idea of who he was. They had to. You see, like the word Hosanna, the way that it's used, it suggests that they knew something about him. It's not used this way. Yay, Jesus, this is really good you're here. It's not used to say to somebody who does something really good, Hosanna. You didn't use it in that context. You didn't, it's not like when your team in March Madness hits that buzzer beater two points to get into the final four and you go, yay! That's not that. That's not what that means. It means this, directly translated, save now. That's right, save now. It's actually a declaration to heaven. God, would you save now? We think we've found someone who can save now. Save us from the Romans. Reestablish your throne here in Jerusalem for God's people. Save now. And then they ask the question, who is this? Does that make any sense? It just seems incongruous with what they've actually just said. If they knew that much, why are they asking, who is this? Well, the text suggests a couple of things that had them a little stumped. And this is why they ask, who is this? One is, Jesus shows himself to be incredibly confrontational. And on one hand, they expected it, but on the other hand, they didn't expect it. Secondly, what Jesus does and what he says is so counterintuitive to what they expect, that they go, we thought he was that, but he can't be that because of what he's done and what he said. Who is he? Do you ever experience that? Do you ever find Jesus annoying? That some of the things that he says are kind of confrontational to you? Like they don't go down easy? You find yourself pushing back a little bit? Do you ever find it that some of the things that he does in your life, they seem counterintuitive and not all that good? Well, then you'll understand the people of Jerusalem because Jesus said some things and did some things that, wow, were they in your face. And secondly, he does some counterintuitive things that just don't make sense to them. And no wonder, though they think they know who he is, they conclude, who is this? Who is this person? I find it interesting that as Jesus enters Jerusalem, he's offered up cheers fit for a conquering and victorious king. But here's the problem. His entrance doesn't look anything like a conquering, victorious king. In fact, it looks like an anti-king kind of entrance. It's interesting that right around the very time that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, maybe even the same day, it could even be at the same moment. It's kind of unlikely it would be that so, so coincidental to happen exactly at the same moment. But for sure the week, maybe the day, someone else was arriving into Jerusalem with a very similar welcome that Jesus had almost the same kind of entrance, except this person is a man of power and he knows that he's a man of great power. We're told that Jesus makes his entrance into Jerusalem from Bethany. 
And uh, that would have taken him off the Mount of Olives through one of eight entrances into Jerusalem. Uh, the entrance is very likely what was called the Eastern Gate or the Golden Gate. Just a couple of hundred yards north and west of that was a gate called the Damascus Gate, another one of the eight gates. It was the entrance that one would use if they were coming to Jerusalem from one of the northern cities or northern territories or from the Mediterranean coast coming into Jerusalem. And that is where the week that we're talking about, Governor Pontius Pilate is coming from Caesarea. You know Pontius Pilate. You know about him, right? He's there in Jerusalem. We know he's there in Jerusalem. Because at the end of the week, Jesus is going to have a face-to-face -face with Pontius Pilate, and it's who the religious leaders plea to, to release Jesus to them so they can take his life. Pontius Pilate is in Jerusalem. Whether he's in exactly the day Jesus is, I don't know. doesn't say that. But someplace along the way, he had an entrance into Jerusalem that was fit for the governor of the province of Judea. Pilate wanted to be in Jerusalem. Not that he loved Jerusalem all that much, but... He wanted to keep peace in Jerusalem. He knew that there was one festival of the year where more people, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people would be in Jerusalem. And with that many people in that compressed space, all kind of religious zealots, he knew that the potential for danger and uproar and rioting was really high. He would find out in four years from now, by the way, that Rome wanted peace in the Roman Empire. Things get out of hand with some Samaritans four years after this for Pilate and he suppresses the rebellion so mercilessly that Rome calls him back to Rome and fires him from his governorship because he didn't keep the peace. So Pilate knows I got to keep peace. He goes to Jerusalem to oversee peace in the city. He's there and when he came in, the whole city would have known Pilate is here. The governor is here in this city at this time. Compare that, if you will, to Jesus. Contrast that. He also comes in as a powerful conquering king, except he doesn't. When Pilate comes into the city, everyone would have recognized him. It was a dramatic demonstration of Rome's power. Impeccably dressed cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather poles with banners, sun glinting off of the shiny armors, the sounds of marching feet in perfect rhythm, the beating of drums, the swirl of dust, the blast of trumpets, because the great Pontius Pilate has entered the city. It was a big deal. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives on a borrowed donkey and an entourage of unremarkable men. But what he is doing he is doing intentionally and very significantly, spiritually and prophetically. Pontius Pilate knew exactly who he was. And so did Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. He was the Messiah King. But not a king like they thought a Messiah King would be like. They actually would have preferred for Jesus to enter more like Pilate than how he did. For them, the Messiah King would come in power and might and would conquer their enemies and bring victory, prosperity, and power back to God's people. That's how it was going to go down. However, what you have is a Messiah King who's humble and gentle and will not kill, will not use violence, but will be violated himself and will be killed himself. And you would think if that was the only part of Jesus' story, you would go, well, that can't work. But what's so confusing is what he says about himself. He says, uh, you know, before the earth was, like before anything was created, I was. Before Abraham was, I was. It's interesting, and just like uh, within the next half hour or an hour of this entrance, Jesus is going to walk into the temple courtyard, and he's going to see people doing business. And he turns over the tables of those merchants. You know that story? And what does he say about the place where they're doing that? He said, you're defiling my house. Whose house? My house. And my house will be called a place of humble, gentle, quiet, trusting prayer. And you've turned it into something other than that. Whose house? It was God's house. And Jesus just said it was his house. So here he comes. It makes no sense. It's confrontational. 
It's okay that you come in meek and mild. That's hard enough to take because we need the Romans overthrown. But you come in saying that you're God? No way. Nuh-uh. You should come in like God then. Powerful and strong and mighty and overturn this whole thing. You see, the contrast was confrontational. Jesus seems to intentionally push people into thinking and trying to figure out who he is. He's a little mysterious at times. He forces people to choose. It's always been almost impossible, it still is, to remain neutral about Jesus around the world. Not just in places where Christianity is kind of the hallmark faith, but around the world. He's been this flashpoint. He's hard to figure out. This simple act of entering as a Messiah king on a humble donkey was an intentional act of confrontation saying, this weekend, Jerusalem, you're going to have to make a choice. You are either going to crown me as king or you're going to kill me on a cross. You're going to get to choose. You can't stay in between. You won't stay in between. That's not an option with me. You cannot pick and choose on that one. It will be the whole package and you will decide. See, that, that irritates us. It bugs us when someone is that bold about who they are and we don't have much choice except yes or no, black or white. This is how it is in many parts of our world today when it comes to that choice about Christ. Now, can I be controversial for just a second? It's that way in every part of the world except the Western developed world where we pick and choose what parts of Jesus we want. We do that. In our world, we get to see Jesus as Savior and or if we choose, Jesus as King. It's almost like there are a couple of options on a spiritual buffet. And we get to, we do this, we get to go to Jesus and say, man, I really like, I like the Savior part. I like the forgiveness part. I know the cross is kind of brutal and all that, but man, that was my, like, that was my ticket out of life without you. Now the king part, however, <laughs> I'm not so much into the king part. I don't really like the idea of you telling me what to do. I don't want to give my will over to you. Like save me, but don't king me. It's a buffet where I'm going to fill up with a heaping helping of salvation and I'll take... Well, I'll take the king as a side dish to go. <laughs> you won't. And I won't either. Because Jesus will have no part of that. He won't. He won't play along. He won't be nice about it. Because he knows something about himself. You cannot take the Savior and leave the king at the door. You can't. He will have it all. Or he won't play games. Can you give you a simple illustration? It's so simple it probably doesn't even work, okay? Let's say you have, a, in a moment of weakness, you invite me over for dinner, okay? It's a moment of weakness because you know you can't serve me casserole and any food with garlic in it, okay? But you take the big risk and you invite me over. I show up at the appointed time, ring the doorbell, you open the door and you go, Brad, it's great to see you. Why don't you come on in? Leave the Claussen part of you out there, but Brad, you come on in. That's ridiculous, right? It's so silly. You'd go, that's a bad illustration because it just can't happen. You can't leave the Clausen part out there and invite the Brad in because guess what? I am Brad Clausen. I'm all that together. And somehow we think we can do that with Jesus. I don't want you to have your way in my life. I want my way. I want to run this life the way I want to run it, Jesus. Like save me. Yeah, but direct me? Like, tell me, tell me how to be a husband? I, I'm going to do that my way. Like, how, to, how to be a, a wife? Like, how to, how to honor my parents? You don't know my parents. Yeah, that's right. But Jesus won't play that game. You can't have him as Savior and ignore him as King. So he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. Hard enough that he's this gentle, mild Savior. 
But then he stands up and says, I'm the king. And that's not what we wanted. We wanted the king to come rescue us and be powerful and mighty, not gentle and mild. It's controversial. And so this is hard for us as well when it comes to who Jesus really is. But that's what he's doing on a donkey and why the entrance he makes into Jerusalem is so profound and so controversial. So, it's controversial. Secondly, it's incredibly counterintuitive. So back to what the people are saying as Jesus enters on that donkey. Remember how they asked, like, who is this? And here's their conclusion. Well, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Well, that appears also, again, not to jive exactly with what they shouted. Their shout was, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us now, King. Save us now, Jesus, Messiah. It's a suggestion that they thought Jesus was a Messiah. Again, those words were something that King David had written in Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm. He's thinking ahead to a day where somebody's going to come and rule Jerusalem like he ruled Jerusalem with fairness and goodness and authority and power. And There had been others beside David. There was Elijah and Joshua and Moses and Elisha. There had been these people before. And the people of Israel, from they were little kids on, they learned about the Messiah coming. Hosanna. Save now. The king is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. They knew that from history. They had been taught. But you know what else they were taught on their parents' knee? They were taught about something from recent history. Less than 200 years earlier. They were taught about a time where a war hero named Simon Maccabee and his sons had mounted a revolt against the Syrians which had controlled the city of God, the city of Jerusalem. They swept into the city and they fought and they killed their way through enemy lines to, to reestablish Jewish authority in Jerusalem, to purify and renew the temple. Hundreds of people had been killed in that revolt. It only lasted a few seven short years and then they were banished and enemies took over again. But her, her, historical records indicate that they were welcomed into the city just like Jesus was welcomed in here. The, the people of Israel knew what the history of Israel was. So it made sense, given the promise of David in the recent history, that the person who rode on a donkey was someone who would look somewhat like David and be strong militarily like the Maccabees, and they would take over Jerusalem and purify the temple. That was expected. However, they knew the man on the donkey. They knew he was a guy named Jesus. He had done some pretty cool things along the way that meant he was endorsed by God. But he was from Nazareth, and they had at one point said, you know, it's not much good that comes out of Nazareth. You know, if you're one of them, it's not all that good. And here he was in the night. It just made no sense to them. It was counterintuitive to them because he should come in victoriously and strong and mighty. And this is not what he's doing. The whole donkey thing made no sense. I mean, who shows up if you're the Messiah of the whole world in a 30-year-old red Mazda Miata? <laughs> really, it's not, it's, it doesn't help your cause. Right? So Jesus is coming to rescue and redeem and he's coming to rule as king, but not the way that initially made any sense to them. He's not coming with killing and fighting and overwhelming with military might or violence against those who oppose him. He's going to do it by losing power, by not resisting, by dying without a fight. He triumphs through weakness and that makes no sense. That's counterintuitive. And I'll bet you've met that God. I bet there's more times than not where something has happened, in you, happened to you in your life and you've turned to God and you've said, that makes no sense. That's not like you. Why would you allow that? Why would you do that? My faith is shaken in you because I expected something different from you, God. I didn't expect this. It seems you pulled your hand back and you're just letting stuff happen to me and it's painful and it hurts and it wrecks things and some of it can't be fixed again. God, what's the deal with you? Or sometimes something happens to you and you go, God, you made that happen. Like, I'm not at all happy with you right now. Can I give you a little advice, God? I've got a bit of a better handle maybe on how to do life than you do. You ever done that? Am I the only one? <laughs> no, I'm not. And the things that God does or allows sometimes are counterintuitive and we don't like him for it. We push back on him. And that's what's happening right here. You see, this riding in a donkey is really a parable of the lifelong mismatch 
between what I want and I'm sure is the right way and what God provides and what God does. Some years ago, I went to the hospital late one Sunday night to visit a friend who had been there for a few days. And as I departed about nine o'clock, I get into the elevator, doors open, I step in and there's this, you know, late 70s, something like that woman in the elevator and door closed and we start heading down. And for some reason that night I had worn a white shirt and dark trousers and that made her think that I was a doctor. (laughs) How wrong could she be, right? (laughs) Right. So as we're starting to head down, she has just clearly made this assumption and she turns to me and she starts telling me about her aged husband who's in the hospital with her and has been for some time and how concerned she is for him and how she loves him and they've been together for so long and she's deeply concerned that the docs have got the wrong medical treatment, the path of treatment for her, do- for her, for her husband. She gives me medications that he's on and tests that they've done and at one point I try, like, I try to step in and go, I'm like excuse me, I'm not a doctor. Like, you don't have to tell me all that stuff. I can't really do a thing for you on that one. You, you know, you've misidentified who I am, but you know when someone just doesn't want to hear it? And they're so tied up in what they're saying? So I thought, oh, what can it hurt? <laughs> just keep talking. I can listen to this. There will be a moment where I can step in and clarify It'll be all right. We get down to the, to the bottom floor. We come out. We're in the lobby of the emergency area. And she's still telling me. She's a really articulate lady. She knows a lot of detail. A lot of detail. (laughs) We're standing there for the longest time. And I'm looking for a moment to break in in the conversation but not be rude, right? So we're talking and I look over and I go, oh, there's some benches just outside the the door of the emergency lobby. And I said, man, why don't we just go sit out there? And so we, she's still talking. We sit down on the bench And she's still telling me about all this stuff. And I can't break in. And then suddenly there's commotion happening in the emergency area outside. And, uh, you know, first of all, try to ignore it. But then there's so much commotion, you can't ignore it. And finally it got her attention and she stopped talking. (laughs) (laughs) And so I used that as an opportunity. I said, man, I'm so sorry. Like, I've been trying to tell you this for a while, but I'm not a doctor. She was profoundly disappointed. And then got even more disappointed when he said, I'm a a pastor. And I said, you know, I I can't give you help on the medical side of things. You you clearly, there are some things that aren't right, and you need to talk to some people about that. But here's one thing I can do. I, I can pray for you, if you would like that. And she said, yeah, okay. So I reached over and grabbed her hand, and I started to pray. And here's an interesting thing. Her hand just relaxed and got slack. And I just had a sense that overall there was just peace that filled her mind and filled her heart. Now, that's not a substitute for the medical information she needed and support, right? She still needed that. But in that moment, you know what God had for her? I just happened to be there. He had something she really needed. She still needed the medical help, but she needed peace. She needed to know there was someone bigger than what medical science could provide, as important as that was for her. She just needed to know that there was something else, somebody else. Kind of a counterintuitive. She thought she knew what she needed, but she really needed something else. And wasn't God gracious to her? Well, finally, the commotion is enough in that emergency area that I excused myself from the conversation after we had prayed. And I went to see what it was. A car had pulled into the emergency area. The driver of the car had jumped out and run inside to get some help. And I could hear a woman screaming, like screaming in the back seat of the car. So I like, what do I do? I'm not sure exactly. So I get up and I open the door. And there's a woman having a baby. (laughs) Isn't that cute? (laughs) So like, like, I'm not sure what to do right then. I'm like, do I help? Do I do, what do I do? And before I can come to the conclusion, the baby arrives. All of it. <laughs> right there. Now what do you do? And as I was about to do nothing, <laughs> medical personnel come in and gurneys and doctors and lawyers and they pull me away. Doctors and lawyers, doctors and nurses pull me away. <laughs> they needed lawyers. <laughs> Yeah, 
and they take care of the situation and you know everything turned out okay in the end and uh, and I went over to the bench and I sat down I'm sh I'm shaken I'm shaken at what's just happened and later that night I will think about just the goodness of God the goodness of God in that setting I can't tell you how many times I've gone to God and told him he's making mistakes in my world, in my life. And this gentle king who comes in on a donkey, <laughs> who's the king of everything, says, would you, could you be patient with me? Could we walk this together a little longer? Before you give up, before you give in, before you crucify me, could you hear me out? Would you trust me enough to walk with me? And we'll sort it out. I have your best at heart for you. I'm sure that thousands of people walked away from that Palm Sunday parade deeply disappointed with what the king looked like. Saddened, frustrated. He did nothing to intimidate Rome. He had no weapons. He had no armor. He had no show of force. It was going to be a surefire failure. And Friday night, it looked like it, didn't it? Except exactly what they needed was who was on that donkey coming to rescue them. I want to read something to you that I wrote down. I wanted to get it right. It's no doubt not original with me. I don't know where it came from. But listen to this. God will always give you what you would ask for if you knew everything he knows. Can I read it again? God will always give you what you would ask for if you knew everything that he knows. That's the king on the donkey. That's the king of the universe. Is he, can I ask? Like, confront? Is he your king? Or is he your savior only? He won't play that game with you. And if you're disappointed with him as king, would you go back to him and wait a little longer with him? He give you, he'll give you, he'll give you exactly what it is that you need and then he'll give you even more than that. He'll exceed what you expect. It's the nature of our great king. Aren't you glad he came on a donkey? Mm -hmm. So Jesus, thank you. You're so innovative you're creative, you're brilliant in your strategies, your, your tactics and your, your way you do things are always thoughtful, they're brilliant, your thinking is beyond ours, your solutions aren't often what we would come up with, but you're king and that gives you, that gives you authority and that gives you right to do things your way. And the choice will be for us whether we'll let you be king. You want to be. You will be if we let you. But you're remarkably gentle. And though you won't play that game with us, you'll wait us out. And then when we're ready to welcome you as king, you will come and do that and be that. Jesus, for those of us that are impatient with you, because if you had authority and you were king, we think you would do things our way. And so we don't wait for you. Would you help us as we wait for you, King Jesus? You go ahead and ride into our world on a donkey or any other way you want, but you come into our world and we'll learn to walk with you and live with you and enjoy you as our king. You are the only king, absolutely forever. And we love you back. Amen.